Welcome to NAC TV Reads the News. My name is Kathy McGrath and I'm one of many volunteers that help create programming for our station. NAC TV can be seen on MTS Channel 30 or 1030, Westman Cable Channel 17, Bell Satellite Channel 592, or online at nactv.tv. These programs are made possible by our volunteers, staff, advertisers, as well as donations made by you, the viewers. If you are enjoying your NAC TV experience, please consider supporting us by either donation or volunteering. You can contact our office at 204-476-2639 or at nactv at wcgwave.ca. And today's issue of the Nipua Banner and Press is for Friday, April 5th, 2024. An epic effort worth being proud of. The Nipua Titans de defeated by Verdon in an intense playoff series. Tim Taconic, number 17, blasts a shot at the Verdon Oil Capitals goal in game six of the best of seven playoff series on Tuesday, April 3rd at the Yellowhead Centre. In this showdown, it was Verdon who were able to survive a late game surge from Nipua to win 4-3. And the Titans never gave up during playoff push. And top picture is members of the 2023-2024 Nipua Titans stayed out on the ice for several minutes after the sixth and final game in their playoff series versus the Verdon Oil Capitals in order to acknowledge the supporters of the team. Above left, Owen Poirier and Jace Larkin celebrate Poirier's second period goal in their game on Tuesday, April 2nd. Above right, Dawson Andre shifts towards the loose puck to eventually score Nipua's third goal of the night in their 4-1 victory over Verdon on Thursday, March 28th. By Owen Devereaux. <coughs> the Nipua Titans refuse to go down without a fight in their playoff series versus the Verdon Oil Capitals. The team battled to the final second to avoid post-season elimination on Tuesday, April 2nd, in front of a near-capacity crowd at the Yellowhead Centre. But despite that effort, they were not rewarded with a positive result, falling 4-3 in the game and four games to two in the series. After the game, Nipua Titans head coach, general manager, Ken Pearson commended the players, not just for efforts in this series, but for what they sacrificed throughout the year. They gave us everything the coaching staff asked of them. And that's just not the last two weeks here. It's right from when they arrived in September. Our veteran guys did a real good job of getting the younger players adapted quickly. And that locker room came together quickly, said Pearson. On the ice, they gave their all, and in the community as well. Anytime they were called upon to do anything, they stepped up. We're proud of what this group of guys did out there and did for this community. The Banner and Press also spoke with Verdon Oil Capitals head coach and GM Tyson Ramsey at the conclusion of the series. He said that Nipua was a tough opponent throughout the regular season and into the playoffs. They made it tough on us. The forward units are fast and the goaltending throughout the year was good and gave us difficulty a lot of times. It was a tough series and we have to give Nipua a ton of credit, said Ramsey. Congratulations to the players, coaches and support staff of the Nipua Titans on their efforts on the ice, as well as in their commitment to the community off of it. <coughs> Moving into some more provincial news. The province unveils its new budget. Premier Wab Canoe and the NDP have released their first budget as the official governing party in Manitoba. The document, which was revealed on Tuesday, April 2nd, included a promise to double the province's spending on health care infrastructure. A huge part of this proposed rebuild of the health care system is $310 million for retention, recruitment and training to address health care staffing shortages. The plan is for there to be 1,000 new health care hires, including 100 doctors, 210 nurses, 90 paramedics and 600 health care aides. 
An additional 635 million will also be invested into capital projects for the health sector, including the re-establishment of the Victoria Hospital ER and the Ericsdale ER. Other projects will include expansion, improvement of electronic medical records, and better equipment. As well, other notable items in the document include an extension on the pause to the 14 cent per litre provincial tax on gasoline until the end of September, rebates for new and used electric vehicles, a plan to connect 5,000 homes to geothermal heating over the next four years, changes to the education property tax that could essentially eliminate the tax for some homeowners. New budget spending will mean an increase in the deficit. The new Manitoba budget also includes an additional 13.7 million in policing costs, policing costs and another 6.3 million spent on public safety initiatives. Canoe has also promised 20 million to search the Prairie Green landfill for three murdered and missing Indigenous women who are believed to be buried there. In total, the NDP government is pledging a total of 1.4 billion more in spending across the board, which is a 6% increase from last year's budget. Manitoba came into the new budget with a deficit forecast of just under 2 billion and projects additions to the deficit of 796 million in 24-25 and 532 million for 2025-26. The province is hoping these numbers will be supported by an extra 960 million through a projected increase of 152 million in added PST revenues and a rise in federal transfers in just under 1 billion. And continuing. <coughs> 4-H at the Manitoba, Royal Manitoba Winter Fair. The Nipuan Area 4-H Beef Club was well represented at the Royal Manitoba Winter Fair. There were a total of 90 animals and 71 juniors competing in the event. From the Nipuan Area 4-H Beef Club, Sviena had reserve champion Shorthorn Heifer and won her split with her 4-H market steer. Madison made it out of her senior showmanship split and was second in her split with her 4-H market steer. Ryder placed well in showmanship with her yearling heifer. Avery came out of her showmanship split and did a great job showing a Simmental yearling heifer for fellow, fellow Rapid City 4-H members. All are pictured here. Madison, Ryder and Avery also took part in the Kirk Stywalt Clinic to start the week. And you can see in the pictures the proud presenters. And Looking Back by Casper Warren. And pictured, this photograph shows the progress that was made in constructing the then new Nipua Co-op building in April of 1974. This photo is from the April 4th edition of the Nipua Press for that year. The completed building still stands today and has been occupied by a variety of different groups, businesses and organizations. And again, the records are missing for this in 1899, so we have an thing from May 1899, 125 years ago. A large load of furniture was being slowly driven down one of our streets the other day. It wasn't one of your snugly built loads, but had inclinations for things above, as it were. It was going the even tenor of its way, the small man behind endeavouring to hang on himself and at the same time keep his equilibrium, went over it, when it, over it went. The language was peculiar for a short time, but after picking up small household sundries for half an hour, it again proceeded to its destination. 100 years ago, April 1st, 1924, Kelwood. The village has lost a landmark during the past week on account of the demolition of the curling rink. The shareholders decided to divide the material in the building and use it for other purposes. Mr. and Mrs. B. M. Collette and daughters arrived yesterday from Winnipeg to take up residence here. Mr. Collette is taking over the Nipua Confectionery from W. J. Fairfield. Mr. Collette was a clerk in Kennedy's store here some 15 years ago. Mrs. Collette is a sister of Ms. Mrs. A. J. McDougall. 75 years ago, April 7, 1949. 
Dr. J.S. Poole of Nipawa, a member of the legislature for Beautiful Plains, surprised the people in his constituency here as he did the members of the Manitoba House when he announced Friday afternoon he would leave the ranks of the co coalition government. Newfoundland's union with Canada will bring into the Dominion some 72,000 school students, many of whom get their education the hard way in outposts and villages. Mr. and Mrs. Peter J. Graham, pioneers of Nipuan District, celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary on Tuesday, March 22nd, with a family dinner at their home in town when all members of the family were present. Mr. Graham was born in Molesworth, Ontario, and came west to Manitoba with his family in 1877. They settled on a homestead east of Nipua. Mrs. Graham of Huron County, Ontario, came to the Union District with her parents one year later. Their marriage took place in Nipua on March 22, 1899, with the late Dr. S.C. Murray performing the ceremony. Fifty years ago, April 4, 1974, Nipawa Detachment of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police began servicing its expanded rural area on Monday, April 1st, and will now be responsible for policing approximately 553 square miles instead of just the town of Nipawa. With the arrival of milder weather, construction of the new Nipawa co-op store is making better progress. The extremely cold weather caused considerable delay in constructing the foundation, but during the past week, Erection of steel has been nearly completed and bricklayers have started laying cement blocks on the north side of the building. Completion of the new store is expected by midsummer. In the meantime, the co-op has rented the former stock hardware building and will also move some of their merchandise into the back part of their temporary office building. Recently, Mr. and Mrs. Lloyd Surrett and their daughter Sally of the Mentmore District went to Lusaka, Zambia in Africa for a two-year stint at teaching and managing a large cooperative fo farm. And note, a part of the excerpt, excerpt included a letter from the Surrett's in which they were settling at Inwell in Zambia. Twenty years ago, Monday, April 5th, 2004, the Nipuan District Chamber of Commerce has joined a growing course voicing opposition to the province's proposed smoking ban. Monty Simon said the province-wide smoking ban, set to take effect in all public places October 1st, will hit rural areas particularly hard. Ashley Larson of Erickson was recognized with the RBC Financial Group Local Hero Award at the 21st Annual Volunteer Awards Luncheon in Winnipeg on the weekend. In addition to sponsoring the award, RBC will make a $5,000 donation to a charity of Larson's choice. Larson, 17, was also recognized by the brand and YWCA as a young woman of distinction last month. The grade 12 student has written and spoken extensively about the crisis brought on by mad cow disease. Larson is part of a family farming operation 11 miles east of Erickson. And also, an ad, the Nipua Cure Creamery was urging businesses to carry their products via this ad in the April 4th, 1924 edition of the Nipua Press. Build up a big ice cream trade. Ah, we miss that creamery. And at the Roxy Theatre this week, April 5th and 6th, and the matinee on April 7th, Kung Fu Panda 4. And April 12th and 13th, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. And Home Buddies from Rita Friesen. I wish you well. In recent weeks, I've been reminiscing with family members about an expression Ed used, I wish you well. For some years, I wondered exactly what the heck he meant by those words, and now I find myself using them. You don't agree on some issues? I wish you well. You go ahead and be yourself, and I should continue to be myself. I shall endeavor not to hurt anyone with my views and accept and expect the same from you. You've decided to do what? Okay, I don't understand or fully agree, but it's none of my business. That would have applied the year we offered safe haven to a transgender youth. After an exchange of goals and reasons, a quiet and sincere, I wish you well. Having received the diagnosis of cancer and not long to live, Ed asked for one couple in particular to be invited to our home. 
He did not want a meeting in a coffee shop, did not want to go to the, their home. He wanted them over as guests. They spoke of many things, prayed together, and then as they left, again a quiet, I wish you well. It wasn't a meeting for a re resolution of differences or anything, but one last friendly visit. Those words are deeper than good luck and different from go in peace. Years ago, one of my aunts and I were discussing life. In the course of our conversation, I disclosed that there were, are some folks who really don't like me. She was wonderfully defensive. How could they not like me? I assured her that I have never gone out of my way to antagonize anyone, have tried to love true to my creed and convictions, but there are people who aren't comfortable with me, don't like me, would rather not speak to me. I'm okay with that. I don't like it, but I'm okay. There are times when I am called to speak of uncomfortable realities. There are times when I'm called to offer correction or direction, and it's, surprise, not always well received. And so, as we step away from the situation, I can say with honesty, I wish you well. The go on for many of us is to go Google for insight and information. Searching for I wish you well, here's what I found. I wish you well means, <clears throat> I hope that you will be well, or I wish that good things will happen to you. It is most often said as part of a farewell. Saying I wish you well to someone can be a bit like saying with respect to someone you are disagreeing with. Reading these comments aloud to a grandchild, they thought they sounded about right. I rather like the second one, with respect, for there are times when my wishing well does not come at the end of a dis does come at the end of a disagreement. Therefore, with respect, I hope you will be well, all of you, and myself as well. May we find ways to disagree with respect, embrace new ideas with respect, change our minds with respect. I wish you well. And the Gladstone Auction Cattle Market Report it was submitted. It's starting to feel a lot more like spring. The snow is disappearing and days are getting longer. I'm not sure if it had anything to do with April's Fool's Day or the fact of the matter that every cattle producer knows what goes up can come down very quickly. With a short week leading into this one and an avian flu headlines in the USA, it seemed like a perfect recipe for disaster for the refreshing cattle market we have all gone to grow into love. Thankfully, the futures regained some of what was lost in the previous week, and the market didn't seem to show much weakness, although softer in spots. Others were slightly stronger. Supply and demand is definitely supporting the cattle market at this time. With any luck, these latest headlines are just a friendly reminder that all good things must come to an end at some point. We sold 1,020 cattle through the ring in Gladstone on April 2nd. The market saw a variety of cattle. The market seemed softer in spots, but was fairly steady for the most part. The first cut cattle are becoming few and far between and are still in high demand. Second and third cut cattle are definitely showing signs of pressure, but are still bringing plenty more than they did one year ago. Cows and bulls traded with plenty of strength from 145 to 160, with sales to 166, showing stronger averages. Bulls traded with strength to ranging between 170 to 197. All classes of cattle sold well. Plainer type cattle are still being discounted. Here's a look at the feeder market. Some market highlights from the April 2nd sale. Black steers weighed 435, brought 480. A local set of one iron char steers weighed 586 and brought 437. Crossbred steers weighed 639 and traded for 409. And a big set of black steers weighed 725 and they brought 370 per pound. Heifers, black heifers weighed 463 and brought 429. A set of crossbred heifers that weighed 525 and they fetched 398. Crossbred heifers weighed 623 and traded for 365.25. And a big set of mixed heifers weighed 741, brought 346 per pound. That hopefully gives you an idea how the market played out. <coughs> And Skate Day in Nipua, scenes from the free skate hoded, hosted by Dan Mazier on March 27th, providing a fun opportunity and allowing Mazier a chance to touch base with his constituents. 
Where you can see some people not skating on the ice, they're quite happy standing, talking around, and others are out there showing their stuff. So, out of Helen's kitchen, Mrs. Stewart's bluing. I was recently surprised to see on a store shelf bottles of Mrs. Stewart's liquid bluing. For the younger people who may not know what bluing did, it is a product to add the white clothes on their last rinse. In the past, a typical laundry setup consisted of three tubs, the wash tub, the rinse tub, and the bluing tub. Clothes and sheets were washed, rinsed, and passed through a wringer, and finally dipped in the bluing tub and hung to dry in the sun. Bluing does not clean or remove stains. Its job is just to lighten and brighten up sheets. In the late 1870s, Al Stewart, a traveling salesman, was a familiar figure in Iowa and Minnesota. Oh, sorry, along with his regular wares, he carried a bluing product that he made in his home with help from his family. He wanted his wife's picture on the bottle, but we, she refused the generous offer. Instead, he used a picture of his mother-in-law, who also had the surname Stewart. In 1883, Stewart sold the rights to Luther Ford, who immediately made plans to distribute the product more widely. By 1925, factories existed in Bloomington, Portland, San Francisco, St. Louis, Pasadena, and in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Today, all production takes place in the updated Bloomington, Minnesota facility, and the formula for the bluing has remained virtually unchanged. When the automatic washing machines came on the scenes of the saying sales of the bluing dropped. It has made a comeback with consumers who want environmentally friendly products. When this happened, the advertising agent gave Mrs. Stewart a facelift. Her stern, olding, older looking face was replaced with a smiling, wrinkle-free face with silver hair and a stylish do. A flood of mail came in from all across North America, wanting the old girl back. She did come back. Mrs. Stewart, despite her age, is computer savvy with a website and email. Today, bluing can <coughs> be used in the wash cycle or the final rinse cycle in most top and front loading machines to restore fabric to the whitest white. Mrs. Stewart's bluing multi is multi-talented as well. It can be added to shampoos to make white hair look brighter. It can be added to swimming pools to make the water look bluer. It is used on show horses to make the horses' tails and manes look whiter. It can help relieve insect bites, create a salt crystal garden, find plumbing leaks, and color flowers. It does not take the time and effort to do our laundry nowadays as it did in the early years of Mrs. Stewart's bluing. Cooking has gotten much easier as well. With sheet pan recipes, you can use just one baking sheet to rip up a pork, fish, or chicken dinner alongside your favorite vegetable. And Helen has given two sheet pan recipes, lemon and chicken pan dinner, and pork and asparagus pan dinner. They look worth a shot. <coughs> Fun, fitness, and friendship. Minds in Motion aids people living with dementia. And pictured is April Heller, Director of Services at Gladstone Senior Support Program. And this is submitted by the Alzheimer's Society. Alzheimer's Society's popular Minds in Motion program launches in Gladstone this April. Minds in Motion is designed for people living with early to moderate signs of dementia and their care partners to help keep both their bodies and brains healthy. This weekly program includes a gentle chair fitness class followed by engaging activities and conversation. April Heller, Director of Services at Gladstone Senior Support, has coordinated with the new Gladstone program with help and support of the Alzheimer's Society of Manitoba. I'm excited to get more local programs up and going here in Gladstone, says April. It seems like people often have to travel out of town for any sort of care or activities, so having the Minds in Motion program here will make it easier for folks to participate. April says the Minds in Motions will be the first dementia-friendly program run by Gladstone Senior Support. Volunteer facilitators and program registrants are already signing up, eager to join the program. I think Minds in Motion is such a beneficial program because it helps keep our minds active, promotes a sense of belonging, and helps to destigmatize dementia in our community, says April. We can always work on creating more acceptance and understanding when it comes to dementia. Registration for Minds in Motion is now open to those in the Gladstone, Plumas and Nipua areas. The program runs from April 4th to May 23rd, 2024, 
and takes place on Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the Senior Support Office, 36 Morris Avenue North. Call Gladstone Senior Support at 204-385-3026 to register. And for more information about Minds in Motion and programs, dates and locations throughout Manitoba, visit alzheimer.mb.ca slash Minds in Motion. <clears throat> and it was a tax plan, it was not an environmental plan. MP Mazier discusses ongoing impact of carbon tax by Owen Devereaux. Dauphin Swan River Nipua MP Dan Mazier has noticed a lot more people are starting to become painfully aware of a federal policy that's already faced its fair share of criticism over the years. On Monday, April 1st, the carbon tax increased nationally by 23%. To put this increase into perspective, the rise in the tax amount tax amounts to about three cents per litre of gasoline. First implemented in 2019, the carbon tax is meant to encourage people and companies to reduce their energy use and shift to lower carbon fuels or renewable energy sources. It came into effect at $20 per tonne in 2019 and has steadily climbed in the years since, raising, raising Monday, rising Monday from 65 per tonne to $80. It is scheduled to go up another 15 each year until 2030, when it reaches 170 a tonne. Canadians are taking notice. While there have been rumblings over the years from some related to the increasing cost, 2024 appears to be the first time the average Canadian has really started to take notice. Dan Mazier, a member of parliament for the Dauphin Swan River Nipua riding, said many people who normally don't pay attention to politics have started to do so intensely. Mazier noted that there is very specific reason for this change in attitude. We've got to the crisis point that people just can't afford this energy. We're creating a whole situation around energy poverty. Never mind about our not owning your house, like you can own your house and do all that, but how the heck are you going to heat this thing anymore, said Mazier. Canadians are waking up to the direct input to impact to them. Mazier added that the rest of Canada is starting to discover what the people and businesses of, West, businesses of Western Manitoba and other rural areas have known for a while. The Parliamentary Budget Officer, as well as the Environment Commissioner, have both pointed out that rural Canadians disproportionately are paying more carbon tax and they're not getting back the same. What I'm hearing is that people are finding life very unaffordable. Your cost of gas has gone up, the cost of groceries have gone up. When you tax the farmer who grows the food and you tax the processors, the current Trudeau government is putting them on an uncompetitive basis, Major noted. It's all of a sudden they're seeing it starting to chew into their bottom line. But it's also not what they were sold was a bill of goods. This is what you know. You do the right thing and you really get rewarded and will save the environment. It's not doing nothing. It's just taxing them. That's why we've been calling it a carbon tax all the, all the way long. It was a tax plan. It was not an environmental plan. The carbon tax rebate re explained. The carbon tax rebate, formerly known as Climate Action Initiative, is part of Canada's effort to combat greenhouse gas emissions, giving people and businesses incentives to reduce their carbon footprint. According to information provided by the federal government, around 90% of the proceeds are distributed to Canadian families through the rebate delivered quarterly. The remaining proceeds, according to the government, are returned to business businesses, farmers and indigenous groups in the same province or territory where it was collected. Opponents of the carbon tax have argued that the exact amounts being collected and then distributed have never been accounted for publicly. Oh, the maple syrup festival draws near. A spring tradition for a charming community nestled close to Riding Mountain National Park is almost here. The McCree Maple Syrup Cap occurs on the second weekend of April and features a wide swath of activities. While this event is as structured as a family-oriented weekend, it still has enough variety to be entertaining for people of all ages. McCree's Manitoba Maple Syrup Festival celebrates local producers, their culture and heritage, and the land. 
Additional information can be found at the Maple Syrup Festival social media pages and its website at www.mbmaplesyrupfest.com. And a picture to above are a variety of scenes from last year's at the Maple Syrup Festival. Looks like people over a fire and people eating and the maple trees being tapped and lots of stuff out on display. And another important notice, April is Cancer Awareness Mount Month. According to the Canadian Cancer Society, about one in two Canadians will develop cancer in their lifetimes and one in four will die of the disease. For women in Manitoba, breast cancer is the most frequently diagnosed type of cancer. For men in Manitoba, prostate cancer is the most frequently diagnosed type of cancer. In April is Daffodil Month. To some, the daffodil is just a flower. For us, it is a symbol of strength and courage. It says we will not give up. It says we will fight against cancer and we will win. There are many ways to join the fight against cancer this April. Volunteer as little as two hours of your time. Do something special for someone you know with cancer. Make a meal, do an errand, babysit. Spread the word through social media or make a presentation in your community to help raise awareness about how Canadians can fight back against cancer. Contact your provincial or local pol politicians to voice the importance of fighting back against cancer and let them know how you can join with the society in this fight. Show support and make a difference in your own way, no matter how big or small. Every three minutes, someone in Canada hears the words, you have cancer, and their life changes forever. But there is hope. Your support this Daffodil Month for the Canadian Cancer Society helps with world-leading research and compassionate, compassionate support that could change the future for someone you love. So I hope everybody keeps that in mind. And Nooner Hockey in Nipua. With the ice schedule set to wind down soon at the Yellowhead Centre in Nipua, the Nooner Hockey Leaguers are looking to get as much time out there on the ice as possible. During spring break, Nooner's regular Murray Black, above picture third from left, was joined out there for a few shifts with his grandsons, Greg and Miles Miller, who were visiting from the Interlake. The young bloods helped to energize the hour for a fun session of midday shinny. That's a good, pretty good crowd out there. High Life's new CEO embarks on listening to her. High Life, a leading global food company, is pleased to announce that its president and CEO, Karen Sangfei, has hit the ground running in his new role. Sangfei has embarked on a comprehensive listening tour, visiting various operations across the company to connect with employees and gain valuable insights. In his first few weeks as CEO, Sangfei has already toured numerous areas of High Life's fully integrated operations, including farm sites, a state-of-the-art Nipua pork plant, distribution centers, wash bays, transportation locations, and more. The hands-on approach demonstrates Sangfei's commitment to gaining a deeper understanding of every aspect of the business and fostering a strong culture of collaboration. One employee, Kevin Escobila, manager of Nipua's Wash Bay, expressed his excitement in joining the CEO for lunch, saying, Meeting our CEO was incredible. I am starstruck. This is a very good for morale. Seeing him on the ground, eating with us, talking with us, it encourages me more to do my work even better. Escobia's sentiment reflects the positive impact Sangfei's presence has had on employees. Sangfei is a seasoned global leader with an impressive track record, brings a wealth of experience to his new role. Prior to joining High Life, he held senior positions as CPF of Samsung Electronics and Myanmar CP Group. Over the past two years, Sangfei has been part has been an integral part of High Life's leadership team and is actively engaged with local communities. Expressing his pride for the dedication and commitment of High Life's employees, Sangfei stated, I am humbled by the depth of insight and passion displayed by our team members. This is just the beginning, and I look forward to engaging with more of our amazing departments and locations. Together, we are building a culture of trust, collaboration, and continuous improvements. 
Sang Fei officially assumed the position of president and CEO on March 1, 2024. His appointment marks a new chapter for the company. High Life looks forward to Sang Fei's leadership's positive impact on the organization and its employees as they work together to drive growth and success. And pictured is High Life President CEO Kan Sang Fei here connecting with a group of Nipua employees while on break. And a little bit of amusement, a snowy little tree. Pictured here on the bottom is Joan McDonald and Olga Duncan were amazed by our particular sight while out on the boat on March 26. During the steady melt of snow, this condo on the corner of Ellen and Brown was left with a patch that quite well resembled a small snowy Christmas tree, complete with a star on top. That's kind of cute. And we'll just move on. <clears throat> Feeling thrifty in Nipua. Accompanying the soft opening of the Super Thrifty Pharmacy, form formerly Nipua Pharmacy, in Nipua this week, was the installation of the brand new Super Thrifty Nipua signage. Crews were busy installing the signage on April 2nd, as can be seen above. Right here, we now have Super Thrifty Pharmacy. And the BP Museum History, the Bamboo Re Restaurant. Pictured here is the interior of the Bamboo Restaurant in Nipua, possibly in the 1950s. Names of any individuals are not available. And the bamboo is still found in Nipua today, but has a bit of a different look compared to the one pictured above. The horseshoe table seen here is quite the picture. And Nipua track athletes compete at ACAC Indoor Championship. Cole Gilbert and Ethan Luzot of Nipua, pictured on right, recently participated, participated in the ACAC Indoor Track Championship in Edmonton, Alberta. Both athletes are members of the Lethbridge College Kodiak's men's indoor track team. And on Mar March 16th and 17th, local athletes Cole Gilbert, son of Patrick and Laurie Gilbert, and Ethan Lazotte, son of Trevor and Tanya Lazotte, competed in the 2024 Alberta College's Athletic Conference, ACAC, Indoor Track and Championships in Edmonton. The weekend was a success as the Lethbridge College men's indoor track team defended their ACAC championship title, winning back-to-back -back banners. Cole is completing his third year Bachelor of Applied Science in Conservation Enforcement, and Ethan is completing his Business Administration Diploma. Highlights from the weekend for the Kodiaks included several podium finishes, one of which included the 4x200 men's relay team taking gold, Gilbert's second leg, and setting both the AC, AC and college record. And back-to-back -back champs. Miniona Elkhorn Seahawks win THHL Championship. The coaches, the players, coaches, and support staff for the Miniona Elkhorn Seahawks take a photo with the Tiger Hills Hockey League Championship trophy after f defeating Killarney in the finals three games to one. Nice. By Owen Devereaux. For the second straight year, the Miniona Elkhorn Seahawks are the top team in the Tiger Hills Hockey League, THHL. The team finished off its season with a 3-2 win over the Killarney Shamrocks on Saturday, March 30th, earning Miniota Elkhorn a three games to one series win. In the series winning game over the weekend, former Parrot Portage Terriers forward, 2013-2016, Brad Bowles scored twice, while Taylor Sanham, who played for the WHL's Calgary Hitmen, 2014-2017 scored what would end up to being the game and series winning goal. Former Nipua Titans forward Ryland Goodnison and Jordan Robertson each scored for the Shamrocks in their defeat. Brad Bowles was named the THHL playoffs most valuable player with 34 points, 12 goals, 22 assists in 11 games. While his brother Jason was on the leading postseason scorer with 36 points in 12 games, 15 goals, and 21 assists. The Miniota Elkhorn Seahawks have now won back to back Tiger Hills titles as well as three straight league championships since they were in the North Central Hockey League champions in 2022. The Seahawks had won the NCHL crown in the league's final season. And the <coughs> best of three final series results. Game one, 
Miniota Elkhorn 4-0 over Killarney. Game 2, Killarney 6-5 over Miniota Elkhorn. Game 3, Miniota Elkhorn 7-0 over Killarney. And Game 4, Miniota Elkhorn 3-2 over Killarney. And we'll go back to here. And there is an interesting letter from Monty Simon, a former Nipawa resident living in Standard, Alberta. Uh, notwithstanding Mr. Reimer's particular issue with Autopack, it was in the March 8th edition of the Banner and Press, I just wanted to offer a little Western Canadian perspective on the four provinces' differences in insurance providers. I spent most of my life in Manitoba, which is obviously Autopack. I lived in BC for nine years, which has ICBC public insurance. I operated a commercial truck for 15 years based out of Saskatchewan that was insured under their public provider SGI. And now I live in Alberta, where all insurance is provided by the private sector. Having had automotive vehicle coverage of various types and unfortunately had to make claims of one sort and another in each of these jurisdictions, not, my fa not fault related for those who wonder, I possess a perfect driving record. I think I can make reasonable assessment of the pros and cons of each provider. What I have found is the public sector is by far a better system. Since three of the provinces use a form of public insurance, their comparison in my experience comes down to the cost. ICBC coverage was and is the most expensive than its western, western provincial counterparts, with Manitoba and Saskatchewan costs being somewhat equal. I would offer that Saskatchewan's public provider is perhaps superior in the sense that SGI also controls its own salvage division, which they can turn to for in-house repair parts and subsequent cost savings. If anyone wishes or hopes that Manitoba would someday switch to private sector insurance with the thought that more comp competition would reduce rates or provide more option, let me tell you how far from accurate that actually is. Alberta insurance is all private sector, and it's a nightmare by comparison. From applications that could be dozens of pages long to each individual company's requirements to prove your worthiness, to excessive year-over-year -year increases for no reason. An example, we insured two vehicles with a company that within the year decided they no longer wanted to do business in Alberta. They sold off their portfolio to another company that jacked our rates 25% with no claims or changes on our part and notified us 10 days before our policy expired. I need to add that allowing a policy to lapse in this system, even if you change providers and simply don't want insurance from said company any longer, is almost like having an at-fault claim as far as how it can affect your rates. And all those rates out here are substantially higher. The truck I had commercially insured by SGI for $1,800 annually cost me $2,300 in Alberta for less coverage, a higher deductible, and absolutely no difference in my driving status. So let me tell all those who, like me, fall on the conservative side of believing in smaller government and leaving personal consumption to the choice of the individual and having such satisfied by the private sector, some things can be and should be provided by public entities. My common sense rule of thumb is that if nearly everyone needs it or uses it, roads, communication, security, etc., then it's something the public sector would provide. It would seem me a vehicle insurance is one of those things. At least in my experience it is. And Ken Waddell's editorial, and there is the disclaimer that the views expressed in this column are the writer's personal views and are not to be taken as being the view of the banner and press staff. There are three kinds of lies. Lies, damned lies, and statistics. The above title, attributed to Mark Twain, pretty much sums up the manner in which citizens of the world are being misled by politicians and academics. The current situation with regard to climate change and the global warming mantra is horrible because of how badly, even maliciously, we are being misled. If you take nothing else from this column, please watch Climate the Movie. I can't verify if every claim made in the one hour and 20 minutes is correct, but there certainly is enough information to seriously question what is being passed off on unsuspecting public as science. And the link is https 
colon slash slash www dot small dead animals dot com slash twenty twenty four slash o three slash thirty one slash climate dash the dash movie dash two slash whew. The gist of the movie is that we are being lied to, and at best it is innocently, but I suspect it is being carried out with malice. It will take some concentration to view the movie, but you owe it to yourself to examine what the green movement, movement is ramming down our throats. Perhaps most telling is the last few minutes when Kenyan farmers clearly speak to how they need fossil fuels, internal combustion engines, and first world technology so they can feed themselves and the neighboring countries. In Manitoba, it appears that the relatively new NDP government may be seeing the light on the carbon tax. Most clear-headed Manitobas realize that if any province in Canada already has a green economy, it's Manitoba. Our energy comes from hydro, which comes mostly from water-driven turbines, natural gas, and some solar energy. Manitoba doesn't need a carbon tax. Yes, we have lots of gas and diesel powered vehicles, but how else are we going to travel and move goods in Manitoba's climate? In addition, Manitoba stores unknown tons of carbon by way of minimum tillage farming and vast forests. Electric vehicles will likely take over someday, but they just don't cut it in many applications. And I re personally resent paying taxes to subsidize the few people who are buying electric vehicles. There's a federal subsidy of up to $5,000, and Manitoba is proposing a provincial subsidy. It's simply not fair to people who can't use the electric vehicle. Carbon taxes are a hoax, a scam in a few different ways. The carbon tax was supposed to raise costs so as to deter people from using as much fuel, and that was supposed to reduce emissions. Well, if higher costs were supposed to work, then the fuel price spikes we saw in the past few years should have answered the question and made the tax unnecessary. Carbon taxes' only purpose are to bloat government coffers. Think about it. Either governments are gaining funds and bloating bureaucracy, or if the funds are all or mostly being rebated, then the rebate process results in even higher numbers of, of bureaucrats. Politicians have swallowed a lie, perhaps of their own making, that people have to be controlled, told what to do, what to eat, told where to go and how to look after themselves. <laughs> after all, the people are pretty stupid, you know. I don't think I have seen a time in my life when governments have such a record of getting things wrong. Over the decades, there have been some dandy screw-ups, but current government's insistence on trying to change the climate takes the prize. I have long said and firmly believe that the climate is changing, but not anywhere near to the extent the government claim. Our climate has been much warmer than it is now, and it has been much colder. And even if man-made activities are affecting climate change, why would Canada or Manitoba strangle our economy and food production when we aren't the problem? Listen, people, get your nose out of your cell phones, out of the cat videos and dinner pics, and get into the real issues of the day. Governments and many other institutions want us to stay dumb. We are much easier to control when we are willfully dumb. And that is the reading of the Nipah Banner and Press for Friday, April 5th, 2024. Thank you for listening. <laughs>